This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. The Inflation Reduction Act is now law and it's going to make a huge impact on the climate future of the country. This is a foundational change to the U.S. energy economy, and we'll be talking about it for years to come. The incentives in the law will help industry bring down the cost of clean tech even further. A lot of the policies in this law are trying to help drive down that cost curve. And the way you do that is by actually producing more, purchasing more. And so this is a strong form of American industrial policy saying we believe these are going to be industries of the future. But passing the law was only the first step. Now it has to be implemented. And that's no easy task. It does take time, but I can tell you, we've got a very committed team in the federal government right now who are already really moving forward quickly. What's next for the Inflation Reduction Act? Ahead on Climate One. In August, President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law. The IRA allocates around $370 billion over 10 years to invest in renewable energy, make EVs more affordable, address climate inequities, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and help mitigate the climate crisis. The IRA follows the passage of the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act and Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Taken together, the Biden administration hopes to jumpstart a new era of U.S.-led innovation, research, and economic growth. But like any law, the way the money is doled out matters, and the law's implementation will ultimately determine its success. Some of the IRA money moves through state governments, including some that are outright hostile to the law. Consumers will have access to a suite of rebates and credits designed to electrify their lives, if they can get the necessary support to take advantage of them. So how do we take the law from words on a page to real functioning programs? Carla Frisch is Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Policy at the U.S. Department of Energy. She previously spoke with Climate One about the bipartisan infrastructure law. We invited her back to discuss the passage of a second big win. It is remarkable. And I'd even say three, actually, if you add the Chips and Science Act in. Uh, So the analogy there uh, we've been thinking about is the backbone, the brain and the lungs. So the backbone being the bipartisan infrastructure law that was put into law last November 2021 that we've talked about, and DB's made significant strides on the implementation. That law was the largest long-term investment in U.S. infrastructure in nearly a century, roads and bridges, but including significant energy infrastructure. Then there's the brain the CHIPS and Science Act, and CHIPS being the semiconductors that are in our cars, our computers, our cell phones, the production of those has been taken over by several other countries. And that is a foundational investment in U.S. competitiveness in CHIPS. And the science part is uh, authorizes additional investments from Congress in science at National Science Foundation and DOE. And then the third piece is the lungs. So breathing into that clean energy economy, the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes deployment of clean technologies and really focus on lowering costs for American families. And of course, that was most recently put into law and we're working through what what are all the implications of those investments now. Right. So there's manufacturing technology, you know, some things playing on different parts of the economy, different time scales. And the DOE estimates that the IRA and the Infrastructure Act, along with other enacted policies, would put the U.S. on a path to reduce nationwide greenhouse gas pollution about 40 percent in the next years compared to the baseline, which happens to be 2005 levels. It is really good news from an emissions perspective. And the 40% is from those two bills. And then there's additional emissions reductions that will continue to come from state and local governments who've been very active in the emissions and clean energy space, private sector, we see all kinds of announcements coming. And of course, continued federal government action uh, beyond what's already happened in those two pieces of legislation. So an important thing to remember too is For a long time, people thought about our energy use, our emissions, and our economic growth as as connected indicators. And they are connected, but we can continue to 
have really strong economic growth while we have really strong emissions reductions. Uh, same thing with our energy use and our emissions reductions. Those are decoupled now. Those are separate metrics because we've got continued economic growth and then emissions going down quite strongly. Right. That decoupling has been the goal to you know, have one go up and one curve growth go up and uh, emissions go down. The Infrastructure Act makes big investments in the nation's electric grid. How will that dovetail with new energy production boosted by this Inflation Reduction Act? It's really exciting. So across the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, you're looking at the full spectrum of research and development to large scale demonstrations through the bipartisan infrastructure law and then significant further deployment through Inflation Reduction Act. There's a connection, for example, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we'll be doing significant demonstrations in hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. And then in the Inflation Reduction Act, you see the next set of policies, largely tax policy, that provides some certainty to investors to be able to take those projects from a large scale demonstration to further deployment. So across the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, I, I really think of it in two buckets plus an underpinning, those buckets being significant investment through taxes and then new programs and loans. So on the tax front, there's tax incentives for individuals and families, as we've had before, uh, but those are, are getting larger in many cases. And then there's tax incentives for the private sector, uh, for companies that are building, installing clean energy technologies. And those tax incentives uh, for the private sector in, in the past, in the U.S., last 10, 15 years, we've had a bit of an on-again, off-again policy that's provided some real uncertainty for investors. And this uh, IRA was done through a, a process called budget reconciliation, uh, which means it requires spending money and it's over a 10-year horizon. So the law provides 10 years of certainty for those investors about what the tax policy will be. And some significant expansions, uh, for example, we talk a lot about the investment tax credit and the production tax credit for solar and wind. Those also apply now to storage, uh, to new nuclear, there's incentives for hydrogen, some really significant changes in those tax investments. Then the, the second bucket being new programs, in, including loans. So at Department of Energy, that includes um, 5.8 billion in advanced industrial deployment, for example, getting to the next generation of steel and cement with much lower emissions. It includes uh, new rebate programs that will dovetail with the tax incentives for individuals and families. And it includes a really significant investment in our loan programs office. And those kinds of investments on a loan, we can provide a loan, we can provide a loan guarantee um, with a smaller amount of money that can really be leveraged uh, by private sector uptake. So that office uh, has, has been ramping their work back up really significantly recently and has much more room to do so now uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act. And then all of that has the significant underpinning of a focus on jobs, on domestic manufacturing, and on justice. Can you give us an example? I know it's early days, and, and this is probably the rules aren't totally set yet. The Department of Treasury is working on some of the you know, implementation rules. But are there examples of the types of projects that might get funding with all this new expansion of federal loan programs? Yes, all kinds of projects. So you could think about um, build out of wind and solar facilities. You could think about build out of advanced manufacturing in the United States, uh, advanced industrial processes. This is a foundational change to the U.S. energy economy. And we'll be talking about it. I bet you'll be doing podcasts about it for years to come. Yeah, a right, really yeah. significant change uh, to the investments in the U.S., and though this has happened before, you know, uh, the, the um, Stimulus Act after the, the Great Recession financial crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, what most people remember about that chapter is a company named Solyndra, which was, failed. And then although I think the, the, the loan portfolio overall did very well and Tesla uh, got funding and paid it back early uh, and is hugely successful. Um, the narrative was lost last time uh, for a number of reasons. So what is being done this time to 
have the more a realistic, authentic narrative of, of these programs. Well, we're counting on you to help us get the story out, Greg. So our loan programs office, uh, even just recently before Inflation Reduction Act, has announced several new loans, uh, 500 million loan guarantee for an advanced clean energy storage project in Utah, which is a really innovative use of hydrogen-based long-term energy storage. Um, in July, a loan to CIRA Technologies to expand manufacturing facilities to produce materials used in electric vehicle batteries. And then also recently, a, a conditional commitment uh, for Ultium cells to manufacture lithium ion cells for electric vehicles. So that office has been very active. And part of the government role is to take on a little bit extra risk Otherwise, the private sector would be doing it on its own. So we have a special role there with the loan programs office. But this, the new elements of the Inflation Reduction Act in, include almost an additional $40 billion in loan authority for innovative technologies. It eliminates a cap on advanced vehicle manufacturing loans so we can do more in that area. And it includes a brand new program, which I'm really excited about, that focuses on reinvesting in clean energy in communities that already have existing or retired fossil fuel infrastructure. So really with that focus on communities and how can we help them get to the future that they want. Right. And all these things sound promising at this point. That's the reason we're having this conversation is about implementation. There have been reports of long delays and permitting approvals for renewable energy. You know, so what's going to be done to sort of make sure that this this stuff happens quickly on a time because there's a concern that like some people want you want to see results pretty quickly, right? And this stuff takes a long time. It does take time, but I can tell you, we've got a very committed team in the federal government right now and civil servants who are digging in and been waiting for the opportunity to run some of these programs and already really moving forward quickly. On permitting, for example, uh, there is a, a parallel piece of legislation being discussed now that would focus on streamlining permitting uh, for energy and transmission projects, both for clean energy and fossil fuels. And that's so, highly controversial. A lot of people are really worried about what could happen there with pipelines in West Virginia, et cetera, the mansion side deal. Right. But the IRA itself includes several provisions to make the permitting process more timely. So that includes through DOE grants to facilitate and accelerate siting and permitting for high voltage interstate and for offshore transmission projects, uh, funding to support uh, hiring and training personnel, equipment, community engagement, really helping accelerate some of the processes that we have in place in the federal government on the permitting front, because that's an area where we think we can do more. You mentioned environmental justice, and the president has talked a lot about that. And there's uh, there was a fair number of people who were upset uh, with what didn't happen in the IRA from the environmental justice uh, community. So what do you say? You know, there are estimates that, um, you know, the, the greenhouse gas reductions from this law will far outweigh additional fossil fuel production. But what do you say to frontline communities who really are quite upset about uh, the harm from oil and gas production and extraction that will still be happening and expanding in some areas, affecting some people that feel marginalized? Right. So for me, this is two things at once. IRA is one of the most significant investments ever in energy and environmental justice. And at the same time, it's not sufficient for what we need. And that will be a continued work in progress. And part of the way this administration is focusing on that is through something called J40, uh, that a, a minimum of 40% of the benefits of investments are going to the communities who need them most. But an IRA, some of the investments include environmental and climate justice block grants, which will run through the Environmental Protection Agency. Also at EPA, a significant investment in better air quality monitoring, which is really important uh, for frontline and energy communities who have air quality issues. Um, one program that really sticks out to me is on ports, because we've got a lot of workers who are dealing with air quality issues at ports. And there's also a significant investment through EPA in improving the air quality through electrification at ports. 
So there's improvement in some investments in J40, I should say, is like Justice 40. Uh, there's more money than before and still not enough. We still need to do more. You know, um, you mentioned block grants. Some of those like home efficiency and improvement ones will be dispersed through the states. And there are Republican governors in states with big wind resources, for example, who oppose the law. So how can the DOE uh, navigate working through governors who frankly, don't want this bill to be a success. You know, there might be some blockages. That's been a problem so far, moving fun, moving money through states that are not cooperative. Well, we've seen governors across the U.S. really focus on investments in clean energy and investments for their residents, whatever party they're part of. So there's an extended set of tax credits for consumers. So we talked about the EV tax credits. For homes and businesses, there's a set of tax credits for energy efficiency, which starting in January will go up in the amount, and those are available to everyone. And then additionally, as you mentioned, there's a new rebate program flowing through DOE to the states, uh, something we did before back in the Re Recovery Act in 2009. And that rebate program includes special incentives uh, eligible for low-income residents. So incentives specially designed for low income, which could include a rebate of up to $8,000 uh, for a new heat pump, which provides heating and cooling. And that's two to three times more efficient than other equipment. And separate rebates uh, for whole home retrofit if you're doing a whole building um, at the same time. And those rebates are uh, up to $4,000 for all families and up to $8,000 for low-income home. So those are new. So we've got a little bit of work to do to set them up and put them in place. But it's really expanding opportunities, particularly for low-income individuals and families. There's also $20 billion for agricultural conservation practices and about $5 billion for forest conservation and tree planting. Let's not forget that piece of this. So why are these natural solutions, where do they fit into the, the puzzle? Well, natural solutions are a big part of climate. If you think about the fact that those trees and the things we're growing in agriculture are sequestering the carbon, and they're the most efficient at doing that, about getting the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And when you look at IRA overall, um, as a person uh, who spent some of my career writing and reviewing reports about what to do about climate change, one pattern you see in those reports, and you've, you've talked about this, is there's no one solution. We've got to work on agriculture, forestry, lands, land use. We've got to work in energy, on the electricity sector, on transportation, on residential and commercial buildings, on industry. And each of those sectors has really significant opportunities. And when you look across IRA, it matches one of many of those reports about the pieces and parts across the different sectors. So there's a lot in it because there's a lot of solutions that are necessary. And it's, it's really amazing to me in the breadth and depth of concrete solutions that are embedded in this law. Right. And there's a lot of industry on board, which certainly gives me uh, hope this time, because by and large, we talked to the auto industry elsewhere in this episode and talking to industry people. They're pretty much on board in this because there's a lot of carrots, a lot of incentives uh, for this. Whereas 10 years ago, industry was in a very, certainly the auto industry was in a very different place trying to slow things down. So that's encouraging. Though, you know, Democrats, as you noted, did do this through the reconciliation process, which has a 10 year time horizon, and there were no Republican votes. And, you know, um, other things that when one party does something through reconciliation, the other party sometimes try, does try to take a sledgehammer to it when they can. How much can be undone by the next Republican administration? Administration. Right. So you mentioned IRA was passed through the Senate and the House uh, by all Democrats. And the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Chips and Science Act were passed mm -hmm. uh, with bipartisan support from both parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those are all laws now. So to undo a law, of course, you've got to go back through the Senate, the House, and the president. Uh, this law in particular is really focused on spending. So a lot of those programs are getting set up and put in, in progress now. So I do think that those will have a lasting effect. And you mentioned industry as well. We have seen, even since this was signed into law, several 
new announcements from industry saying because of the Inflation Reduction Act, we are investing more in the U.S. That includes an announcement from First Solar. They're the largest domestic manufacturer of solar. We've got a lot of the supply chain for solar right now is in China. And so we are playing catch up on that supply chain. And they announced that because of IRA, they are investing $1.2 billion to expand their operations with a new manufacturing facility in the U.S. Southeast and expanding their existing footprint in Northwest Ohio. We also saw new announcements from a company called Sparks with a Z that will locate an electric battery factory in Northwestern West Virginia. Honda Motor and LG Energy Solution announced plans to build a new battery production plant for EVs in the U.S. And Toyota announced a global expansion in spending on EV battery manufacturing, including $2.5 billion earmarked for a new battery manufacturing facility in Liberty, North Carolina. So that's just in the few weeks since this came into law. This law, for the first time in the country's history, as I understand, we are using tax incentives, specifically energy tax incentives, to uphold and improve job quality. So one of the foundational principles of the tax credits and other parts of IRA are a focus on prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. So embedded in the structure, in the design of the tax credits, is this explicit focus on labor. And those two are tied together in a way that that we have not seen before. And it creates a really significant opportunity, both for expansion of clean energy, but also for expanded job opportunities and for the expanded quality of those job opportunities. And as we continue to make more investments here in the U.S. of having that domestic supply chain, of having strong quality job opportunities and building out more justice, uh, we are creating a real opportunity that people will want to continue to grow. Carla Frisch is Principal Deputy Director of the Office of Policy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Carla, thanks for sharing your insights on this sprawling and promising climate law at last. Thanks so much for having me. Coming up, how will the IRA help bring down the cost of clean tech? You have really demand-oriented incentives to make the purchasing of it cheaper in the market, right? So you actually can get uh, not only the factories created, the supply there, and actually the demand flowing. We'll be right back. The Inflation Reduction Act has multiple incentives that were designed to help bring down the cost of clean tech and speed up mass adoption. Brian Panchatsaram is senior advisor to the chairman of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins and co-author of the book Speed and Scale. He served as Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the United States during the Obama administration. He talked with Climate One's Ariana Brocious about the new law. The Inflation Reduction Act includes the largest amount of climate funding we've seen, about $370 billion, and the consumer facing side of things like tax incentives for EVs and home improvements have gotten a lot of attention. But what part of this law is most exciting to you? Yeah, Ariana, the, the most exciting part of this law is that before it, the United States did not have significant climate policy that was market driven, right? And so when you think about the clean energy deployment that we need, the electrification of vehicles that we depend on, there are parts of this bill that make that happen, right? And so that's what's incredibly exciting is it actually puts America in the fight. Whereas if we were having this conversation just a few weeks ago, a month ago, we'd be trying to figure out how states could pick up the gap or how companies could do things, or we'd be talking about other countries and how they inspire us. And and today we have the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a significant climate bill that we can celebrate as an American thing. So this law expands clean energy tax credits for wind, solar, clean hydrogen, and other clean fuels. What difference do you see this making for things like hydrogen and other clean fuels? Yeah, for so for clean fuels, you know, that's where industry is still incredibly nascent, right? When you think about the hydrogen fuels that we need and can exist in both this bill and if you rewind back to the bi- 
partisan infrastructure law. There was there's funding in that to create demonstration plants, right? And so I think one thing to think about is this actually actually as a series of laws that have passed that are going to make a lot of the climate realities we want to come to bear. So in the earlier laws, you have demonstration projects, you have uh, uh, funding from things like the loan program office now that can support the building out of factories and facilities. And then you have really demand oriented incentives to make the purchasing of it cheaper in the market, right? So you actually can get uh, not only the factories created, the supply there, and actually the demand flowing. And so this is sort of a very thoughtful approach on making some of these technologies that don't exist at scale today to come to fruition. Right. And I'm curious, what is going to make them marketable and how will this help? For a lot of clean technologies, they are expensive, more expensive than the fossil fuel burning equivalent. Um, in some areas like solar and wind, we've seen this aggressive price drop over the past two, two decades. And now that green premium doesn't exist anymore for them. There truly are a green discount when you think about them, right? Picking those are cheaper. But when you think about some categories of electric vehicles, when you think about sustainable air fuel, those are still more expensive than if you or I were just to go buy a normal car or try to just hop on a flight flying normal air fuel. And so a lot of the policies in this law are trying to help drive down that cost curve. And the way you do that is by actually producing more, purchasing more. And so this is a strong form of American industrial policy saying, we believe these are going to be industries of the future. How do we support them? How do we make them cheaper so consumers can then be able to afford them outright when these policies end up fading out? And what about the timeline for these types of technology? And maybe we could also expand this to talk about battery technology, the timeline for making these, you know, bringing those costs down, making them much more accessible. So the neat thing is for battery technologies in speed and scale, we have this tracker that looks at a few, a handful of key results, key things and key measures that need to be on track if we want to remove the carbon pollution that we produce. And for batteries, the price of that has dropped so significantly in the past 10 years. And not just that, the scale of building them have picked up. And so from a cost point of view, those that you know trajectory is there. It's um, one that now the question is, well, where are we going to purchase those batteries from? If you looked at the Inflation Reduction Act, there's in the EV policies, it actually changes it to now, you know, it only applies to vehicles built in North America. And then when you look at it, there's a ratcheting up of, well, where do the batteries and minerals come from too? They've got to come from US and their allies. And so here you're seeing one, yes, it's possible to produce batteries at scale cheaply, but we want them to be produced here or between one of our trading partners. Among some of the other technologies that are getting boosts from this bill is carbon capture and storage. This is somewhat controversial among climate experts and environmentalists. Many say it's ineffective and will actually keep us more reliant on fossil fuels into the future or for longer, um, and that the money could be better spent on proven technologies like wind and solar. Carbon capture and storage usually refers to capturing carbon dioxide at the source of the pollution, like a coal plant, that's distinct from direct air capture, which sucks carbon pollution, carbon dioxide that may have been emitted many, many years ago out of the air. So right now, the second direct air capture is very expensive. And I'm curious what you think about government money going to those kinds of projects when there are, as we've said, some of these other things we, we can and should be investing in. Yeah. The, so the first category, so I, I think money should be going into absolutely the direct uh, uh, air capture type projects because we need to explore them. We need to build them up. But then there's this category of bulk projects that do get funding that you can take CO2 from industrial processes and use it for enhanced oil recovery. I don't think that's the right way or really the way we're going to get ourselves out of this. That's just a way of pumping more oil and getting a credit for it. How will the funding drive more research and development in consumer tech, like better and more affordable heat pumps and electric water heaters, maybe, for example? You know, there's a set of funding in the IRA called the High Efficiency Electric Home Rebate Program, right? It's going to provide a good chunk of money to help with assisting around anything certified by the Energy Star Program, right? Around uh, heat pumps and electric stoves and better insulation. And it's targeted to low-income families and to really support the transition. Because sometimes those choices are more expensive up front, but the savings that actually come from lower energy costs truly make that you know return on investment calculation 
quite a good one for most families. And, you know, one thing to think about right now, too, on this whole electrification shift, as well as using less energy, more energy efficiency, you're seeing this crisis happen around the globe right now, around natural gas prices, as well as oil prices. And we have to look at, well, one, how do we cut our emissions? But in every bit of energy that we do use, how do we conserve as much of it as we can? And there are new technologies like heat pumps. So instead of burning you know, natural gas in your home, you're actually using this thermal exchanger that's able to be both heat and air conditioning for you. And it's able to do it using only electricity, able to do it incredibly efficient, efficiently, which means you spend less on energy. And I think you're going to see not only the IRA really pushing these advances, but just general global factors and reasons encouraging more energy efficiency to happen. You worked as Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the Obama administration. So what can you tell us about how federal money like this rolls out and how quickly we might see the money hit the road, so to speak, and begin to take effect? Yeah, this is um, it's all about the implementation now. Right. So the president, Congress have done their part, which is to appropriate the money needed to instigate the shift. But within the Department of Energy, within the loan program office, within each of these offices that have now been appropriated dollars, this is where the work starts. They're going to be doing outreach actively and immediately, understanding from the business community as well as from the climate community how to deploy these dollars well. And so I'll say, Ariana, the process is absolutely happening immediately. The question, of course, when the money comes out, each of the programs is able to do it at different timelines. But what's neat is there's already that process flowing from the bipartisan infrastructure law, right? So there's a lot of demonstration projects that they're already evaluating and looking at. And so I think we're going to see a lot of successes and announcements as this year closes out and into the next and even more the year after. But it really is about the execution of the law now, too. Um, I think it is worth saying for any law, right, it could be implemented poorly. So this investment that we're making as a country could be spent poorly, and it could be also spent incredibly well. And do you see any obvious pitfalls in the way the IRA and the funding works that might limit its impact in terms of that implementation? The way that IRA came together was you had a whole good year and a half of work on a Build Back Better, on different great ideas on how to move the U.S. to a carbon-free um, country. And when the bill got shuttered, I don't think anyone had hoped that it would resurrect itself. And when it did, to see so many components of the market-based things in there, right, the tax credits, to see components in there around supporting the carbon removal pieces, you, you got really at least excited that this was a bill that was supporting the market in driving this, right, which is an important piece. But the other things in the bill that were the trade-offs that were around oil and gas leasing. And the unfortunate thing is, in this moment in time, this bill, while it does, I think the way the uh, uh, analysis looks, it goes for every ton of emissions that, were, that are generated by these oil and gas provisions, 24 tons are removed. So for every ton, 24 are removed. And so from you know, zooming out and looking at the big picture of the world and emissions, this bill is phenomenal. But when you go back to the local level, right, to the families and communities that live next to an oil well that's not being shuttered, when you go to a community that still has a coal plant, this extends its life. And so this trade-off was made. And but what it what it means is that there's still plenty of work to be done that can happen at the EPA. There's so much work that can be done to happen at the state level, right? This is only one piece of the policy puzzle. Federal government is doing its part. What are the states going to do? What are local governments going to do? And so that's where to focus the energies. So what are some of the other ripple effects that we might see once this bill takes hold? I think about it in terms of there being some kind of tipping point, right, where even if the investments in some of these technologies could seem modest, there's enough of it happening all at once that the sector just kind of moves ahead. So on the on the policy side, yeah, let's talk about policy and then as a consumer, right? So like there are policy tsunamis, right? I think one of them that's happening right now that's like starting to form is around banning gas in buildings and helping people transition to uh, heat pumps as well as induction stoves. You have multiple cities across the country that have passed these bills. 
and more are following suit. And it's an incredible way to not only remove the emissions footprint of a city, but to have clean air in your home. Remember, when you have a stove and you turn it on and you're, you know, just even boiling water on it, that's burning natural gas and methane inside your house. And so one, if you have that, please turn on the vents. But two, look at that and see that you are combusting something in there and it's actually affecting the air quality. And so that's one, I think, tide that you're seeing coming from a, like a policy point of view. On the market side, you know, when you look at project financing, right, this is the money that goes out there to help support these solar projects and wind projects and uh, now storage projects as well, too. A lot of projects, I mean, project financing isn't charity work. It's a bank coming out there and saying, based on the tax code and the incentives, what is truly a profitable thing to deploy? And you're just seeing so much solar wind. And now because storage prices are dropping, being deployed. And so that's a tsunami wave. When some uh, public utility commission or a city or even a company that has a large facility getting built, when they do the math around what's the right energy choice, the neat thing is the clean energy choice is one that can be proven to be cheaper and more resilient. John, uh, my co-author, John Doerr, has this, this incredible saying, which is when the right thing becomes the profitable thing, it'll be the probable thing. And so when you actually have something that's profitable, which tends to mean that the green premium is gone and that green discounts there, market forces get to take over Ariana. And then this transition goes blazingly fast. Oh, uh, I think the place where you're actually seeing that is truly in electric vehicles, right? Year over year, just two years ago, it was like 3%, then it was 6%. And then just at the end of last year, globally, was like 12% electric vehicles purchased. In China, it was 26%. In countries like Norway, you had near 100%. And so that's where you know, this transition becomes really optimistic. And I get very hopeful. You know, I think there's a lot of folks in the climate community that have been fighting this fight for 20, 30 plus years. And I think for a lot of us that are coming in, maybe let's just say in the past five, well, and we get to stand on their shoulders and get to you know, really build on their work, but we also get to take advantage of the market forces that exist today where the clean green thing is cheaper. And for the things that aren't, we have policies in place to help drive them down. And so we've got a lot of work to do to implement the parts that IRA is supporting. Cleaner grid, clean vehicles, fixing our food system, protecting nature, cleaning up our industry, and then removing carbon. If we can do all those things, we're going to be in a wonderful place at the end of this decade with the momentum that we need to get to zero by 2050. Ryan Penchad Saram is advisor to the chairman at Kleiner Perkins and co-author of Speed and Scale. Thanks, Ryan, for joining us on Climate One. It's wonderful to be here. Coming up, a quick primer on the new EV tax credits and what effect they could have on consumers and the supply chain. There's a lot of uh, good opportunities in here for clean energy. I think one of the big ones is there's a, a brand new production tax credit uh, for clean energy production, which includes EV batteries and critical minerals. We'll be right back. In addition to all the money and programs written into the IRA, legislators also define carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases as pollutants. This is seen as an attempt to mitigate the damage done by the Supreme Court's West Virginia versus EPA ruling, which severely limited the EPA's ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Climate One's Ariana Brocia spoke with Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of Berkeley Law, to find out how that congressional clarification might affect the implementation of the Supreme Court's ruling. I think it changes the impact in that it makes clear that greenhouse gas emissions are pollutants. On the other hand, I don't know that that addresses the concern that the Supreme Court had in West Virginia versus EPA. West Virginia versus EPA said that Congress hadn't been sufficiently specific in giving the EPA the authority to regulate power plants in a certain way so as to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Or to put it most simply, I think it goes part of the way to addressing what the Supreme Court said, but it doesn't go all the way. And I've seen different interpretations by legal experts about the impact of this wording. So what's the sort of um, far end that you've seen in terms of the most the most significant implication of what the wording could be in, in favor of the EPA's authority? It has to be remembered that the Clean Air Act was adopted 50 years ago 
And as a result, it wasn't adopted with a thought towards greenhouse gas emissions. This is unequivocal in making clear that the EPA does have the authority generally to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. But it may not be specific to power plants and in the applications such as the clean power plan that the Obama administration tried to put forward. The question is whether this change in the law is enough to give the Biden administration the ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. Chief Justice Roberts' opinion in West Virginia versus EPA said that the EPA was using an obscure provision in the Clean Air Act that no one had ever thought included regulating power plants in this way. And I think the question is, is changing the definition of pollution to include greenhouse gas emissions enough to address that concern? And how will we find the answer to that question, just by seeing it play out? The Biden administration has said that it's going to adopt its own plan for regulating greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. It's important to put in context, the Obama administration created the Clean Power Plan that was designed to deal with the very significant issue of greenhouse gas emission power plants. The Trump administration rescinded that and adopted the Affordable Clean Energy Plan, which was far more permissive with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. The Biden administration says, we're going to adopt our plan. When it does, there's sure to be a challenge again by states like West Virginia and coal companies, and the courts will have to answer with this statutory authority, is it allowed? I think this statutory authority is very important. I don't know it will be enough. It will depend on what the Biden administration is trying to do. Erwin Cheriminski is dean of Berkeley Law. The Inflation Reduction Act promises to pour a ton of money into electrifying transportation. But new rules now restrict which electric vehicles qualify for a $7,500 tax credit, limiting the cash back to models made in North America. And through the end of the year, those rebates are not available to buyers of cars made by GM and Tesla. In January, there'll be a whole new set of rules. Dan Bowerson, Senior Director of Energy and Environment at the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, the car industry trade group, explains. It, it gets much more complicated starting in <laughs> January 1, 2023. So the first thing that happens is uh, that 200,000 vehicle cap is gone. So for uh, companies that had already hit that cap, General Motors and Tesla, that, that cap is, is no longer in play. It also I- implements a MSRP cap. So it's $80,000 cap for vans, SUVs, and pickups, and $55,000 for cars. We also see uh, the implementation of income caps. So for uh, couples filing jointly, uh, if you make over $300,000, you would not be eligible for a tax credit. And for individuals making over $150,000, you would be ineligible. Okay, so that these are new things that didn't before. It didn't really matter, like how much money an individual makes or how much uh, what the car costs. So now there's some different uh, limits in play, and there's some other things as well, right? And sourcing. Yeah, that, then it gets even more complicated. So <laughs> that's what we're here. That's what we're here for. Yep. Yeah. So we take uh, we we take that seventy five hundred dollars uh, tax credit and we split it. So half of the credit, uh, three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars is available if you meet those other requirements and at least 40% of the critical minerals are either extracted or processed in the U.S. or a country that we have a free trade agreement with. The other half is focused on battery components. So the other $3,750 would be available if at least 50% of the components inside the battery are either manufactured or assembled in North America. So you have to meet all those prerequisites and then you look at where the batteries are manufactured and where the critical minerals are are uh, extracted or processed from. So unfortunately, um, I'm not aware of any vehicles that will qualify for the full $7,500 with these provisions in the, at least in this timeframe. There's a lot of work going on there, but this timeframe is pretty tight uh, to meet, uh, to meet both of those requirements. And to be clear, like this sounds like a lot of rules and some people might say, oh, gosh, why is this so complicated? Is the intention here, A, is not to subsidize rich people buying cars, that it's not a good use of taxpayer dollars, and also to drive American industry. Is, do you agree that those two intentions here, this complexity is, is, is in place because of those two intentions? Yeah, I think those are the, the right intentions, Greg. It's, it's to yeah, not subsidize the rich, and the intention is not to subsidize products coming from, from China. Um, I think 
you know, we agree with the uh, intention of not subsidizing China and more domestic manufacturing and processing. Unfortunately, I think it's a missed opportunity here without having some implementation lead time uh, to, to get there. Right. And so it sounds like, you know, automakers are announcing new EVs all the time, Jeep and uh, GM this week. Um, it sounds like there's, there's more choice on the marketplace, but will these rules restrict choice or expand choice or is it unclear yet? Hey, it's it's still kind of unclear, Greg. Um, I think it's going to certainly, like I said, restrict the, the the choice for vehicles that are going to receive that credit. So that's going to you know play into uh, customers' considerations of of what vehicle they're going to purchase. And we should be clear that there's still going to be lots of EVs available. There's, we're seeing all these ads uh, on TV, the U.S. Open, Super Bowl, etc. The industry is clearly going in this direction, and, and these rules we're talking about only for these. Um, tax incentives or rebates. There's, people can still buy the car. It just, if they uh, don't need those public dollars, is that right? Oh, absolutely, Greg. Yeah. I think uh, today we have uh, 72 EV models available. We expect that number to increase by 2026 to over 130. So we're going to see a doubling of EVs on the road. You're already seeing, you know, SUVs, pickup trucks, things, you know, vehicles that previously we, we weren't seeing electrified. Now, all of a sudden we're seeing a lot of those come to market. So yeah, there's going to be all shapes and sizes, all uh, utility factors coming with uh, with an electrified option. Sure. And I think the F-150 Lightning is a huge cultural moment uh, in many ways. There's a new rule, uh, you touched on this a little bit, that battery uh, components can't be sourced from foreign entities of concern like China, where a vast majority of battery parts and minerals come from. How is this going to affect supply chains? Just be clear that, that no uh, components from an entity of concern, including China, starts in 2024. So that's an additional requirement on top of what we have in 2023. So if any component in the battery comes from China, you disqualify for either of the two credits. And then 2025, that applies to critical minerals. You know, it, we were already hearing manufacturers looking at how are they looking at their supply chains. You're, you're seeing unique partnerships with battery recyclers and auto manufacturers that we hadn't seen before. The reason there is you want to keep those materials and minerals domestic and kind of keep that domestic supply chain secure and reliable. So I think that's going to continue whether or not it'll be the credit of this this tax credit or not. I think it's the microchip shortage that we're still dealing with has kind of opened a lot of people's eyes of what uh, not having secure and reliable supply chains can do to an industry. So Washington and Detroit have often been at odds over you know, rules, et cetera. Does overall, do you think this is good policy? You know, I think the customer incentive piece, I think, uh, as I mentioned, is a missed opportunity in the time frame that we're talking. I think that there's good provisions in the bill, both on the manufacturing side, but on the consumer side as well. You know, there's a brand new used electric vehicle tax credit available that was not present prior to, to the signing of the bill. And that's going to be significant, I think, for, for those customers that can't afford or don't purchase new vehicles. This is going to be an opportunity to get them into uh, an electric vehicle. So uh, that's a very positive uh, outcome of the, the bill. So what is this going to mean for the manufacturers and for American manufacturing? There's a lot of uh, good opportunities in here for clean energy. I think one of the big ones is there's a, a brand new production tax credit. Uh, for clean energy production, which includes EV batteries and critical minerals. So that's, you know, another incentive to, to manufacture domestically. Uh, there's also uh, an, invest, an investment tax credit. Um, and then, you know, not on the supply side so much, but there's also an extension of a credit for alternative refueling infrastructure in low and moderate income areas. So again, coupling that on top of, you know, the used EV tax credit, I think we're now going to get to an opportunity for maybe those customers that EVs weren't feasible, that they're now going to become more feasible for, for those communities. One of the big things that happens in the auto industry is what California does. California recently said they're going to allow only zero emission vehicles by 2035, which is basically kind of this interesting point of California catching up with the industry because the industry has already said, the automaker has already said, we don't want to sell gasoline or diesel cars and trucks after 2035. Yet there is the potential for tension between what California does. And in the past, that has split the industry. And some companies cited with California, Ford in particular, GM and Toyota uh, didn't. What, what would happen in the future, you think, if Republicans try to challenge California's ability to set stricter standards? What would the industry do? 
I don't know what uh, a change in an, a federal administration would look like or, or what their priorities might be. Um, if, if I were able to, to, to guess that, I think you and I'd be having a different discussion. But what I do know and what I can say is these are global companies and the, the, the global transition is happening to electrification. We're seeing it in Asia. We're seeing it in Europe. It's, it's happening all over the world. So, you know, changes on domestic policy don't necessarily dictate what, what's going to happen with these companies. I will say they're also investing a significant amount of money into electrification. And, and this is real money. We're, we're over $600 billion by the end of the decade in electrification. So half a trillion dollars over that just in electrification. So we're going to continue to see increased uh, adoption globally. Um, and as you mentioned, you've already seen uh, several companies announce either their phase out or, or phase down or complete transition to, to electrification. And as the industry transitions from making internal combustion engines, as it's done for a century, it's General Motors, Ford Motor Company. These are motor companies. What happens to the workers? Yeah, it's it's an important piece and one that uh, cannot be forgotten. But I think there's there's an actual opportunity here as well to to educate the workforce, current and future workforce, of you know available jobs from this transition. You know, we're going to I've talked about the utilities, so we're going to have to see increased employment in the utility sector to in, ensure that the grid's stable. We're going to need EV charging companies to to build and install the chargers. Uh, we've talked a lot already just about the increased battery manufacturing and material processing here, those are all going to require workers. So we need to make sure that those are well known and that those are uh, there's some education there. We need, also need to make sure that there's training uh, for those jobs. And I think you'll, you'll continue to see that going forward um, to, to ensure that, that the workforce is not forgotten. That, that would be a, a, a huge mis, uh, misstep on, on this transition if that's forgotten. You've expressed some hesitation about how some of the rules were written. Sounds like you'd like a little more ramp time. You agree with the overall direction, it seems. What can be done at this point to implement the Inflation Reduction Act in the best way possible? Yeah, so the, um, the, the legislation requires the Secretary of Treasury to issue guidance uh, by the end of the year as far as how this is going to be implemented. And there's a lot that needs to be included in that guidance. And then from there, the vehicle manufacturers are going to be required to uh, certify that their vehicle or their battery contains, you know, X percent of components from this country and Y percent of critical minerals from these countries. And then it'll be up to, you know, the Treasury and the IRS to determine if that vehicle qualifies. But it'll be a lot of uh, a lot of handholding and a lot of discussions to, to get there because this is something brand new and and, and quite frankly, the IRS has not been this involved in, in vehicle uh, manufacturing and sourcing. Uh, so this will be uh, a, a new, uh, new challenge here. So it sounds like a promising, complicated, but, you know, uh, very promising moment in the industry. Yeah, I think that's right, Greg. I think it's a, a good opportunity here for, for some collaboration between government, between industry, between customers, between dealers. It, really, we all need to be working together here. Wouldn't that be nice in this country? Dan Bowerson is Senior Director of Energy and Environment for the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. Dan, thanks for sharing your insights on the complexity and promise of uh, the new EV rules. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Greg. On this Climate One, we've been talking about implementing the Inflation Reduction Act. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be exciting, interesting, and also hard, awkward, and difficult. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of our society and our lives. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>